Hello everybody, welcome back to the workshop. So today, as the title implied, let's talk about overthinking heat treatment of steel. Uh, now, there is a lot of myth, there is a lot of legend, there's a lot of science, there's a lot of facts, there's a lot of information around the subject of heat treatment of tool steels. And what's the right methods, and what's the wrong methods, and this guy does it this way, that guy does it this way, this guy, you know, claims that, you know, quenching it in the blood of virgins is, you know, gets this thing superior, where this guy parts 50 oil is even more superior than that. And this guy over here, he, you know, he smokes Puff the Magic Dragon, and so therefore, you know, it's an amazing, it, you know, he's way more enlightened than you are when it comes to heat treating steels. But I'm here today to take and pretty much kind of simplify it for the beginner and for the noob. Now you can dig as deep as you wish in on this subject, but if you are a part of my channel, I teach one method of heat treatment of steel. That method may be wrong or right in your eyes, depending on what you choose to believe about it. So let me get real specific about this. In these two tools here, I've got two separate tools, I, and they've both been heat treated separately. They've been heat treated two different ways, and they both work and form and perform and perform function perfectly. They both function perfectly. They're both made out of the same material, or roughly there too. Uh, in fact, actually, I think they're both made out of the same piece of coil spring. So this is made out of coil spring. Do I know what it is? No, I do not. I don't know what the spring steel is specifically, and I don't really need to, nor do I care to know what specifically the material is. And here's why I say that. These two tools that you're looking here on this table are, this one here's a representation. This is something I've just done for a video series on chasing, but it's done in the same exact method that I've done all my other chasing tools for the roughly the last, oh, I don't know, six years or so, okay? And this here is an early on chisel, slit chisel, that I made with my landlord and my mentor, my friend, um, that taught me a different way of doing heat treatment and what he used for 50 years in the shop. And this was his heat treatment method that he would do for all spring steels. So there's two different techniques here. This one was taught by Tom Latinay. This one here was taught by another mentor of mine, my landlord, Raymond Sim. So when we do these two, uh, Raymond Sims passed away, by the way, and this, and then this one here, uh, you know, Tom Latinay is obviously still with us and doing amazing work. I suggest checking out his work if you can. Let me get to my point. This here is done where I harden the entire tool and then I draw the temper to about a straw color. I quench this in water. So it's a water quench. Now, I've already heard the shrieks and screams coming from across the internet. You harden tool steel in water? Yes, Smiths have been doing it for centuries. For centuries eons has steels and simple carbon steels and things of like spring steel and stuff have been hardened in water. I needed a water quench on this tool because I'm going to be engaging other tool steels and other hardened steels, well annealed, in mild steel and I'm going to be doing chasing while cold. So this needs to be as hard as possible in order to retain its edge. So this will get drawn back to a very light straw color. And if I fear that it has more stress or I'm going to take more stress on it, I will draw it back to a bronze color. What do those colors mean? They mean nothing, essentially. Basically, if you've gotten a tool hard enough, if you've gotten a tool to its peak hardness, any coloration that you pull it back from peak hardness is softening the steel to a point. This requires testing, as it has for a millennia, of guys taking and working and making their own tools. This one here was created with a much different approach that's even worse and less scientific than this one. 
This chisel has been in my shop for 10 years. This is a decade. This is the original edge on this chisel for a decade. This is the original struck end. I've dressed the swelling off of it a little bit, but this is my original chisel, slit chisel, that I started with, heat treated by my landlord for the last decade. This chisel right here, it was brought up to a critical temperature, and I say critical loosely, it was brought up to a non-magnetic state, let's call it that, and then it was quenched in water, the whole tool. Then, well, not the whole tool, get me wrong here. This was left as forged back here, and this part here was brought up to a non-magnetic state and then quenched in water. And you say, okay, well, Roy, that's, that's a lot like what you're talking about on here or like anybody's methods. Yeah, but here's how it was tempered. This end was put in the fire and heated and then until it got to a nice cherry red temperature. That means a color about like this here, as you can see. It was brought to a cherry red temperature and then it was taken and gripped in a pair of tongs and I kid you not, ladies and gentlemen, took into a soft piece of pine a little tiny bit of pine and we would rub the edge on that piece of pine that soft pine until it just left a char mark and then the whole tool was quenched in water this has been around and has survived for the last decade the last 10 years did we get lucky no i think not that comes from experimentation and it comes from not overthinking the process of what you're doing. Because if you're arguing out laboratory results, talking about all these different things and all this metallurgy that happens to the tool steel and all this other stuff and how you need, you know, perfect ways of measuring the exact temperature and exact critical temperature and things of this nature, you get into this belief that you're never going to be good enough or you will not be able to actually make good tooling without very expensive equipment. But I'm here to tell you, even with very expensive equipment in your shop, you are not a laboratory. You are not in a specific atmosphere at a set humidity, at a set indoor temperature, at a set temperature range on your quenchant at a very set and specific things to get textbook results. You're never going to get textbook results. Large factories do this in fact that they want to get they have a range they have a scale. That's why when you look at anvils they say they're between 55 and 60 Rockwell or maybe they're between 52 and 54 Rockwell. Again they have a range, they have a level of tolerance because they are not in a factory and breaking pieces off their tool and putting it under a spectron microscope to make sure that they're right in a controlled environment. That is impossible for a blacksmith. It's impossible. So this brings me to my next point. Should you always seek to do the best that you can? Yes, you should. I know I'm ranting on about this a little bit, but I really want you guys to take this to heart because I've received a lot of emails here lately about people who are, you know, second guessing themselves on heat treatment and, and things like that. And you have got to understand that blacksmithing has been around documented for at least 12,000 years here, guys. And in that time, they've used all sorts of steels and qualities in different grades to make tools. Some were successful, some wasn't. We have more information now than we've ever had on the subject of tool steel. But the problem is, is sometimes you can go on over information overload about this process and you overcomplicate it. Keep it, please, to the KISS method, okay? You just have to keep it, keep it simple smithy. 
or whatever a connotation you want to take and say at the end of it. But this right here is the most important thing in your shop. A tool is meant to do a job. It is not meant to last lifetimes upon lifetimes. Tools wear out. Tools have to be redressed. Tools have to be sharpened. They need to accomplish the task at hand. Choose a method that you are comfortable with and maybe you're not satisfied with that. Maybe you're not satisfied with using a pine technique or using the technique that I got taught by Tom Latney and the way he hardens his, his uh, chasing tools. Maybe that's perfectly okay. You, you, don't have to, you don't have to do those techniques. Maybe you want to get yourself an even heat. Maybe you want to get yourself a very specific tempering oven and a very specific oil bath and a brine and all this other stuff that you hear guys talk about and you can get as deep into this subject as you like. But basically with the subject of tooling and tool steels, keep it simple smithy. If you don't do this, especially as a beginner, you get too wrapped up in the technical calities of this and you realize very quickly that you're never going to be able to make something as simple as a chisel. So why even try? Why even start? My channel is based upon and wrapped up around you guys out there as beginners in your own shop. I've been making my own tooling since I started a decade ago and I will continue to make my, my own tooling in the same ways that you are seeing me do now for the next 30 years of my life, if the good Lord blesses me with that many years on this planet. Is my method right? Is my method wrong? Don't know. I really don't know. I'll leave you guys to be the judge of that for yourself, of whether my methods will work for you. If they don't, please find a method that works for you, but at the heart of it all, keep it simple, Smith. So that's going to be it for this video. That's going to be it for this little rant. I hope you guys found something useful in this information. Maybe you did, maybe you didn't. Let me know in the comment section, uh, you know, one way or the other. Like always, God bless you, and we will catch you on the next one. Thanks for watching.